Okay, thank you all for uh, for joining us, and uh, it's nice to see uh, familiar faces and some new faces uh, to our class as we continue this class. Just a little housekeeping next week. Uh, we will be away with our family, uh, sort of the last week of the summer, um, and therefore there will be no class. But uh, God willing, after that, we should be back onto a regular schedule um, uh, on a weekly schedule. So this week's Torah portion is Parsons of Es Chanan, page 958 in the Art Scroll, Blue Art Scroll Chumash. Um, and the word Ve'es Chanan literally means employed. Uh, we say it's called praying, right? Ve'es Chanan al Hashem be'esayi le'mar. And I employed, I, I, I begged, I prayed right, to God right, at that time saying, and then Moshe goes ahead and he begs from God, he begs from Hashem that, um, I want you to have to like bend your head the whole time. There you go. No, no, I feel bad. Like I want you to feel comfortable, right? There you go. You're good. Okay. Um, so, so Hashem is is begging. God, Moses is begging Hashem to allow him to go back into the land, to allow him to go into the land of Israel. As we know, and Moshe it was decreed on Moshe for the sin of the water when he hit the rock instead of talking to the rock. It was decreed that he won't be able to go into the land of Israel. Him and Aaron, that's when it was decreed they can't go into the land of Israel. And Moshe now is saying, Hashem, please, let me let me go into the land. Right? Be'esah he at that time, because they just finished winning over the wars of Sichon and Og, the countries right on the border of Eretz Yisrael, right? uh, which would probably be now like uh, Jordan area, something like that, um, along that peninsula over there. Um, and uh, he thought, okay, so I was, I'm so close. I'm on the border, right? I'm in the lands of, of where Menashe and Ephraim, it's called Avar Yardin. Some of the tribes will be living there. So, so maybe there's a chance for me to go into Eretz Yisrael. And Hashem tells him, sorry, Buster Brown, but it ain't going to happen, right? <laughs> ain't going to happen. You can't go into the land of Eretz Yisrael. And that's the first part of this parsha. The, the commentaries uh, ask a few questions on this, and I want to just talk about a few points on this. Part. That sort of goes to the end of chapter three. One question is, is I don't get it. Hashem decreed, right, that you're not going to the land of Israel. Hashem is just. So what's Moshe Rabbeinu driving himself crazy? Like, like Hashem decreed, you know, it, it's not going to happen. Right? So what was Moshe thinking, right, to, to Eschanan? It's a language of, of employed and begging, praying. It says he prayed, I remember exactly how many, 500 and something prayers, right, What's he like? What's he? What's he trying to accomplish over here? If Hashem decreed that he's not going to go into the land of Israel, so so um, so the Mefarshim explain commentary says something very powerful. The Moshe Rabbeinu is teaching us, right? Even though the answer is no, but Moshe Rabbeinu is teaching us that we could always, we should always pray to God and ask God for 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 some for for what we want. Right, if as long as it's something good, right? We shouldn't ask God for uh, something that's against halakha for it to happen, right? Whatever that may be, right? But if it's something that is within the framework of halakha or it's not against halakha, you know, we should go ahead and we should employ and ask Hashem. He's our father, just like a child, right? As uh, it happens all the time, right? We tell our kid, no, you can't, uh, you have to get off your Nintendo now. Please, can I have another half hour? Can I have another 20 minutes? Can I have another 20 minutes? And we say, no, no, no. Why are they asking? They know this happens over the holiday. A few times you say, okay, next to 20 minutes. But then they ask again. Why are they asking? Because a child should always have the opportunity and should have should know that they should be able to ask from their parents something. That's our relationship with Hashem. Relationship with Hashem is that we are his children and he's he's our father, right? And therefore, right, we should always have that 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 desire to want to ask, even though we probably know the answer is no, right? Most Rabbeinu knew that the answer is probably gonna be no, and right? but he still went ahead and asked. And that's something that's extremely important that we can learn uh, from Most Rabbeinu. And sometimes the answer is yes. And even when the answer is no, that's the other thing. Most Rabbeinu took it gracefully and we we, you know, when the answer is no, it's ultimately best for us because we know what's best for us. Hashem knows what's best for us more than we know what's best for us. Right? But that's a, a different point. That's one idea that we learn from here. The other idea that we learn from here, right, is that what did Hashem tell him? Right? Hashem says, stop. Right? So Hashem says, stop your davening. Right? He says like this, says, uh, he says, um, 
Um, it said, Al Tosef Daber Eli Od. In verse 26, Al Tosef, don't add the middle of verse 26. Al Tosef Daber Eli Od. Do not add any more to talk to me about this. Enough is enough. Stop. Right? So the commentaries learned that what's that? It's a funny way from Hashem saying, like Hashem just said, it's okay. No, the answer is no. Like, no, Hashem said, stop. Like, <clears throat> right, stop asking me, right? It's okay. So, you know, we sometimes do it's enough. You know, you asked 10 times already, it's not going to happen. Right? But the commentaries explain that really, if most Rabbin would have kept on asking, right, the power of tefillah, the power of prayer is so powerful that the answer would have had to switch to yes. And therefore, Hashem said, no, it cannot be that you cannot go into the land of Israel. It's my decree. We'll talk about that a little later, why that was a decree. I mean, you cannot go into the land of Israel. And therefore, I'm asking you to please stop davening, right? I'm asking you to please stop davening because your prayer is so powerful. We're in the level of us, but all of our prayer is so powerful that if you would have continued, right, it would have had to have been a yes. That's not, that was not the right thing for, for the universe, for Moshe, for the Jewish people right, at that time, for Moshe Rabbeinu to go into the land of Israel. So, again, another tremendous lesson about prayer. Number one, we should never stop prayer, right? Uh, I, I don't think, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but at least me, I don't think I'll, I'll ever reach that level. Most of Rabbeinu Hashem has to tell me to stop davening. We're not, I'm not holding on that level of the power of davening, right? But at least we see how powerful davening is, right? That we should never give up. We should always continue to daven, always continue to, to, to ask Hashem, right, for whatever the need, our needs are, um, because Hashem had to tell most Rabbeinu to stop, to stop davening. So those are two very powerful ideas that we learned from here. Now, the other one is we touched upon a little bit in a few weeks ago, third portion, I just want to talk about it very quickly again, uh, just an interesting point about it. What does is, what is Hashem tell him to do? Uh, go up to the mountain and look at the land. You can go up, but go ahead and take a look at it. Right, so what we asked last time was, is you know, it's like taking a kid to a candy store, or to you know, a toy store, right, or uh, a guy, someone to get to Apple store, right. I personally don't have any Apple equipment, but okay, right. Uh, but you know, take it to a store and say, just look, you can't have anything. Like, what's the do? Like that's the answer. Go up to the mountain and take a look, and but you can't, you're not gonna be able to go in, but take a look at it. Right? That's not a nice thing. So said you can't go in, and you know, just forget about it. Don't worry about it. Like you know, whatever. Don't. Don't think about it. Don't look at it. Don't like, you know, get all excited about it. So the, the commentaries explain, right, that, and we touched, touched upon this a little bit last time, that the, the, there's a, there's, when you look at something in spirituality, most of you didn't want to go into the land of Israel for, you know, for, for, for the skiing and then and the Hermon and for the, you know, floating in the Alamelech. That wasn't the reason why he wanted to go into Eretz Yisrael. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. And it's beautiful. It's God's glory, beautiful glory. But he wanted to go to Eretz Yisrael because there's certain mitzvot that you can only do in the land of Israel. He wanted to go to Eretz Yisrael because of Har Maria, where the Temple Mount's going to be. He wanted to go to Eretz Yisrael because that's where our forefathers are buried. He wanted to go into Eretz Yisrael because for every step that you take in the land of Israel, you get a mitzvah. You know that? Now you get a mitzvah by walking. Right? Not only do you get, you know, your calories and your steps in, right, on your whatever Fitbit that you have, right? but you get a mitzvah, right? You get, for every step you take in Eretz Yisrael, you get a mitzvah. Most, that's what most Rabbeinu wanted to go in. And when, and we spoke about it a little bit last time, right, but so Hashem was telling him to be able to at least see where there's opportunity for a mitzvah, to be able to look at, you just look at the Kotel, right? You go to the Kotel, you go to the Kotel, even if you can go, you see a video of the Kotel, right? You still get inspired a little bit, right? So Hashem was telling him, you're right, you can go into land, but at least you could take out some of the energy, some of the spirituality, by at least taking a look at it, which is not the same as going in, at least take a look at it. And that's, again, something for us to reflect on as a remind ourselves, it goes both ways, unfortunately, right? It goes both ways. On one hand, when we look at something, right, it can inspire us. On the other hand, when we can look at something, it could inspire us. I don't know if that's the right word, right? But it could, right? It can make us uninspired or, or, or God forbid, want to do things that, that, that are not the right thing. Um, just to get a little a bit off tangent, right? Um, and and I, I, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine. And uh, we were just marveling how society has changed so much over the last 25 years, right? Over the last 25 years, society has changed dramatically. What is considered, what is considered okay, what is considered, you know, 
uh, what's not okay, how we talk, how this, how that, you know, it's like, it, it's, it has changed dramatically, right? Uh, of something that 25 years ago, your typical American will, uh, you know, say, no, that's not okay. Right? Now it's like, praised. And now it's like, yeah, that's great. Right? And how did that happen so quickly? How did it happen so quickly? And even people that back then, right, would think it's not okay now, not all of them, but now some of them would know they changed their tune. How did that happen? And well, the internet, that's true. The internet has a big part of it, right? But I believe, which is the same idea, movies, movies, right? And, and media, right? Thank you, media, right? Seeing songs, media, right? Uh, articles, uh, magazines, uh, movies, TV shows that slip in, right? And at the time it was considered controversial, right? It was considered controversial. You know, I, I was talking to someone um, and they told me that when they were a kid, right? In the sixties, right? Um, it was, uh, it was it was it was not considered appropriate on a TV show for to have, uh, you know, a man and woman in the same bed, right? Even have a man and woman in the same bed, it was considered inappropriate. Right now, you'll be lucky, you know, if they're whatever. That's we're, we're recording this, right? Right, exactly. Man and woman, how much? What's considered appropriate? PG now has 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 pool parties in it, and and pool parties are not, you know, that's. You can imagine, you know, that's a regular PG. What would be considered PG is it's okay. They consider that's appropriate for young kids to, to see and to it. It has, but it's the process of how it goes is it slowly but surely it affects you. Uh, and, and when we see something in the beginning, we get disgusted and how could it be and you know, this and how can we do that? Right? And then slowly but surely as it continues or whatever. So then we slowly go, okay, whatever. It's just a movie. It's not real life. And then, okay, it's just an hour. Uh, and then eventually it affects you, right? And affects you. And, and then you become desensitized to it. Okay, it's not for me. It's for that. Okay, wait, well, we have to approve it. And we could start. Exactly. Right, but the, the what we're bringing out from this point is it goes both ways. We could be inspired by seeing something, right? We we take we every if we every day. Um, did someone knock there? Okay. Right? If we if every day we we take a look and we we come to shul and we see people davening. If every day we go to the old age home and we see people helping people out. If every day or or twice a week, whatever it is, when we go and we see, we take a video camera, we look at the Kotel Maravi, the the Western Wall, and we see people praying. Right? When we look at things in a pot for that are spiritual, and that's what most Rabbeinu was doing. That's what Hashem allowed him to do. Then we build spirituality within us also in a gradual way, and we become more accustomed to it. And yes, okay, we're going to keep us something uh, normal, and then and then addressing. Uh, you know, modest is 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 okay. Is, is okay. It's not crazy, and and and, and giving uh, my ten percent, and then coming to shul, and, and not going to racquetball on 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 Shabbat, right? whatever it is. It's a process. It, these things take time, but it's it becomes part of who you are, and that's the power of seeing something. That's the power of of being part of something. Right? It could both be for good. We hope. Unfortunately, it can be for bad, and that's you know how we have to be so careful. Um, what we look at, what we see, what our children see, what our friends see, anybody that we have ability to have influence over, right? These are things that are extremely important. And that's what, that's what we learned from this story of Moshe Rabbeinu. Any questions or comments before we move on? Okay, so let's move on. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is chapter four, we're still on the same page, right? This part is jam-packed. We're not going to be able to go through all of it, but we're going to just try to skip around a little bit. All right, so chapter four, Starts off with, Ba'ata Yisrael, and now Israel, right? Shema al Chukim, listen to the to the commandments and the Mishpatim, right? Chukim is really uh, decrees, right? The mishpatim are the laws. Asher Anochim, Elam, Tehitzchem, that I am teaching you today to do, right? Lema Tichyu, in order that you should leave, Uvas, live, Vasem, Yirasem, Yisrael, and you'll come and you'll inherit the land. Asher Hashem, Lekach, Anoshin, Lekem, that Hashem, your God, gave to you. And then it continues uh, regarding the idea of, of keeping the mitzvot, right? Uh, it continues uh, It continues on that. It's very interesting, actually, this week's parsha, and I remember the exact, I didn't have a chance to look it up, but 
it the amount of times and it's something interesting trivia to do. I, I don't remember the exact number. I have to look it up, and I didn't have a chance to look it up this time. But the word Shema, right, is is mentioned many times in this week's parsha. Right? Many many times. Right? Shema Yisrael, right? Uh, the actual Shema Yisrael is in this week's parsha, right? But Shema El Achukim, listen to the Chukim. The word Shema, right, listen is mentioned v- many many times in this week's parsha. What is so significant about Shema? Listen. Right? What, what, what is this idea that we keep on saying, Shema, listen, listen, O Israel, right? listen to this chukim, right? and it's, it, it mentions it many other times in this week's parsha, right? when we sort of could go through it, you'll, you'll see, right? but what's the idea of Shema, of listen? Right? So the, the, the commentaries explain something extremely, extremely powerful, that we so many times we so many times, and I, I do this also, we so many times have preconceived notions about things, right? We so many times um, sort of think that we know what's right based off, you know, reading things or, you know, hearing uh, or just our knowledge or how we think it or what I think is right and wrong, right? And, and the Torah is telling us, Shema, listen, right? We have to stop and listen, right? And listening doesn't mean to say, as you know, my mother told me many times that it goes in one ear and goes out the other ear, right? <laughs> and I've heard that many times from my mother as a kid. Right, exactly. Shema, listen means to say absorb. That, that's what it means, absorb, right? Shomea, right? There's a law, there's a law of Shomea Ka'one. Shomea Ka'one, when you listen as if you are saying the blessing yourself, right? So, it, for example, there's an obligation to, to read the Megillah, right? The, per, the Megillah on Purim, right? Megillah's Esther, there's an obligation to read. Each one of us have an obligation to read. Are we all standing with the cloth and reading the Megillah? No. What are we doing? The Chazan is, the Balkora is Leni. He makes a blessing before we answer our main to fulfill the blessing. But when we are listening to him, read the Megillah, Shomea, listening, Kaonis, as if you are saying it yourself. I had the same thing when we when I make when we make kiddush, right? One person make kiddush, other people are listening to it. When they answer a main, right? They're answering a main is showing that they're part of this book, but they didn't actually say the words. Shomer kaona, someone that listens as if they are saying the blessing themselves. So listen, it doesn't mean to say just listening. It's absorbing. It's it's taking it in. It's 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 it's, it's articulating it within yourself. That's what Shema means. Shema doesn't mean to say just to listen, right? And we're going to, we're going to speak about that in a minute when we say Shema Yisrael later on, we're going to speak about the, the rest of the Shema Yisrael. But Shema, and that's what Moshe Rabbeinu is saying, Shema El Achukim, listen to the decrees and to the commandment. Don't just hear it and say, oh, okay, very good, right? but actually absorb it, right? Take it in, reflect on it, Realize that you don't know everything. Realize that your preconceived notions on something is, is is just your preconceived notions. But when you listen to something, absorb it, articulate it within yourself, digest it, right? And 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 and, and allow it to resonate within yourself. And and I like the word marinate within yourself, right? That that you could then go ahead and and change, right? And and take the next step. That's what smart. Right? And it's so, so, it's so important, right? We, we're especially, I mean, we're always, but especially now we're living in a generation where everybody thinks they know everything, right? The, everybody thinks, little kids think they know everything, right? No, daddy, I know how to do it. I can take care of it, right? Or they just, you know, I'll, I'll ask Siri and or whatever other things that there is out there. They'll tell me, they'll tell me how to do it now. AI will tell me how to do it, right? Everything, everything will tell me how to do it, right? I, I, I could take care of it. I, I could take care of it. And we have to remember that in Torah and in, in, in spirituality, the way we grow and the way we allow the information that we hear, you, you could, it could be someone that, you know, I was, I was talking to a friend of mine in Israel and I was still living in Israel and he was telling me, yeah, there's this um, professor, um, you know, a non-religious professor who is a professor in Talmudic studies, right? Talmudic studies. And he was asking, like, if he's a professional and he knows Talmud and he knows and he could quote it. And he, so, like, I don't get it. So, like, why is he, like, not religious? Like, like what's? And, and the answer is very simple, right? 
are you learning are you learning Torah just as a knowledge right just to have the knowledge you hear it and it's interesting and it's fascinating and there's a whole group of people in Korea and and and, and a place in Asia that learn Talmud because it sharpens the brain right it is it does it sharpens the brain right there the 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 analytic and how it, it, it the cases and this and that and back and forth it does it sharpens the brain and it does but so are you learning it for that? Or are you, are you listening to the Talmud? Are you absorbing it? Are you taking it inside of you and realizing that it's more of a lifestyle? It's a way of living. It's not just a knowledge like math and science and other things. Right? Torah is something that we're supposed to be, make part of who we are. Shema, listen, absorb it. Let it marinate within yourself. Right? And that's where Moshe Rabbeinu is starting to again, continue to talk to the Jewish people about, about, uh, about how we're going to live in the land of Israel, how we're going right, to, how to make sure that we have the Torah that's part of us. He's teaching us this important lesson that that's how we do it is by Shema, by actually absorbing it and not just hearing the information and say, okay, great, that was, that was great, nice class. I never had that many. Oh, Rabbi, that was, that was a very interesting class, a very interesting class. And I say, okay, thank you. Right? And then you move on. I always tell people, try to take one piece, one small thing, and take it within yourself. Absorb it, marinate it, let it digest it, right? Reflect on it, right? One thing, it's hard to do for everything, but one thing, and then hopefully one thing could turn into two things or three things. But we have to make sure that, we, that we're that Shema, we're listening to the listening to Torah, and not just as, a, as another knowledge that, that we, yeah, interesting, fascinating, that was a great lecture, right? And uh, okay, I got something, I'll remember something, and that's not that's not what Torah is all about. Any questions or comments? Okay, you guys are an easy bunch today. And, okay. Right. It's, uh, that's later by Shema Yisrael later. That's by Shema Yisrael. So uh, just uh, before we like sort of take a little jump into later into the parsha, I just want to talk about one more uh, verse uh, four. Uh, chapter 4, verse 4. So we actually turned the page, uh, 960. Right? Uh, and it says like this. It said, right? Right? But you will be clinging to Hashem, your God. You are all alive today. Right? You're all clinging to, uh, to, to Hashem, your God. You're all alive today. So the word vekus. Have you ever heard of the word vekus? Have you ever heard of it? Vekus is used in the in the in the um, in the sort of educational language, right? As Dvekus is a level of of connection, right? Of of reflection, and, and someone's uh, having Dvekus. He's, uh, I think there's actually uh, uh, one of the Jewish CDs is called Vekus or something like that, right? It's was a more like uh, inspiring music. Right, so that's what Dvekus means. Where does it come from? It comes from this verse over here. You are clinging to Hashem to God. But it's much deeper than that. It's telling us really, uh, most Rabbeinu is where we start off with Shema, how we're supposed to absorb the information. And now he's telling us, what is this supposed to lead to? How do we know if we're going the right direction? Is our relationship with Hashem has to be Dvekus. What is Dvekus? So the English translation translates clinging, right? So clinging is like connected, right? So someone's clingy, right? That's like a negative way, right? They're very clingy, right? Um, you know, or some people like, maybe people are clingy to them, right? Okay, for different discussion, right? But that's the clingy, right? Um, but but it's not really the best translation. The vekos, right? How do you say glue in modern Hebrew? I don't know. Okay. Glue in modern Hebrew is devek. Devek is glue in modern Hebrew. That's how you say it, devek. It means to say that it's glued together. Dvekus means to say that the word they're using is clingy because that can't really use like glue right? Uh, but clingy really means to say that a person's attached to you, right? That's what, that's what clingy, someone's attached to you. He's clingy, he's hanging on to you, he's following you, he's being always, right? Or, or she, could be both ways, right? Um, but that's what clingy means. So that's where they use that translation. But vacuous means to say that our relationship with Hashem has, should, we, try to, we should try to get to a relationship where we are the book, we are, we are sort of glued to Hashem. Now, of course, we're not literally glued to Hashem. It means to say that everything we want to do, right, all our actions are, are, are to connect ourselves to Hashem. 
right? To be closer to Hashem. He was doubled by Hashem. In the Mishra Shashar, in the path of the righteous, he, that's what he says. He says the root and the, and, and, and the foundation of all service to Hashem is to be doubled by Hashem, to be glued to Hashem, to, to, to have a, a yearning to be connected to Hashem. And how do we do that? We do that through the mitzvahs. Right, through the mitzvahs, every mitzvah that we do, right, every mitzvah that we do, every com- every commandment that we listen to, right, or negative commandment that we straight uh, stay away from, that is how we become close and and connected to Hashem. That's how we do it. And when we we wear a yarmulke and we put on tefillin and we give tzedakah, right, and we we come to services and we 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 don't eat what we're not supposed to eat and we 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 light our Friday night candles and we we don't say lashon hara. And, Whatever it is, whenever we're doing that, and again, Shema, you listen, so you're absorbing it, you're doing it because you want to have a relation to Hashem. Of course, you get rewarded if you're doing it now, like the way you're doing it, because it's a moral thing to do. That's beautiful, right? But that's not Shema, that you're not internalizing and realize that you're supposed to be building a relationship with Hashem. We have to be double, we have to be connected to Hashem. And that's, that's the ultimate goal. Now, it's not all or nothing. Let's forget, now remember that, right? You can have different levels of glue, right? You can have like, you know, regular glue that, you know, sticks a little bit and then it sort of rips off. And then you can have like wood glue. And then you can go to the store and you can get, uh, you know, uh, crazy glue. And then you can get the gorilla glue, right? And then you get there's different levels of glue, right? And then there's the instant glue and then there's a 24-hour glue and there's this and the clear. Okay, there's a whole level. We're not going to give a class on glue right now, right? But there's different levels of glue. That's the same thing also. Our relationship there's, we, we're building it up, right? we're building it up, but we have to be gearing towards having the Vekos Hashem to have a, a relationship with Hashem where we are trying to be connected to Him. We're trying to yearn, it could be clingy to Hashem. It's, I guess it's a good thing, right? right? But but th- that's really what it means is really to be glued to Hashem, to be connected to Hashem. Any questions or comments? Okay, so let's move on. Let's move on to... Um, uh, verse 21. So most Rabbeinu, I'm sort of going to go go very quickly over this. Right? So most Rabbeinu says, Re'eh, really before that, verse 5, Re'eh, lamati eskem chuk mispatim, I have taught to you, Re'eh, look, right, see, and we're not going to talk about this now because next week's parish is parish is Re'eh, but I'm not going to be here, so let's talk about this for a minute, right? So I forgot about that, I'm not going to be here next week, so let me go back a minute to verse 5, right, Re'eh, no, it's not actually, next week's parish is Eikah. Um, so we'll talk about it, Parsons, or A's in two weeks, Parsons, it's fine. Let's talk about it very quickly over here. Re'ei nasat lefnechem, right? Lamadati eschem, I've, look, I've placed in front of you right? the, uh, the chukim, the, the, the decrees, the mespatim, the commandments, like, excuse me, like Hashem commanded me, right? What does Re'ei see? Hashem said, Shema, listen, right? Or, uh, or, 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 or no, right? Yadata, you should know that I placed, right? What's Re'ei? Re'ei means to say to see. We'll talk more about this in Parsha Re'e, which is in two weeks Parsha. But very quickly, right, the concept of Re'e is, we, is that there's different levels of knowledge. We'll expand on this uh, in two weeks from now. But very quickly, it's different levels of knowledge. The level of knowledge of seeing something is the highest level of knowledge, right? There's water in this cup, right? If you say, no, no, it's not water, it's soda, right? So first I'll look to see if there's bubbles. No, there isn't bubbles, right? So it's not soda. Right? It's Coca-Cola, right? That's for sure. I don't even have to look at that. It's not Coca-Cola, right? You can't convince me otherwise. I see with my own eyes, right? If you tell me that, you know, downstairs, you know, there's a, uh, there's, there's tons of soda downstairs. I say, okay, yes or no, could be. I mean, why should I not believe you, right? But I don't know for sure. It could be you're pulling my leg. I don't know why, right? But okay, you know, you're just having a good time, right? But it could be, it could be not. So there's different levels of knowledge, right? So most Rebbein is telling the Jewish people, hey, look, I have placed in front of you these commandments you should have it as a knowledge as being able to actually see it with your own eyes. We'll expand on this on this idea, hopefully in Parsis Ray in a few weeks. I just wanted uh, to point that out. So then most Rabbeinu goes, right, um, regarding uh, the different, um, that, that you guys came to me, right, um, and the different commandments. And then uh, he, it says, um, if you go now to verse 20, 21, it says uh, over there, Moshe Rabbeinu throws in, "Vashem his sanaf be al divarchem, right? Be shava levilti avri seyarden." And Hashem, his sanaf, got angry, right, on me, 
right? That's af comes from the word af, anger. Vesan af, you got angry. B with me. Al divrechem, because of your words. The Shava and he swore the vilti avris yardin. He swore that you're not going to go into the yardin. You are not going to go over the yardin right, to the land of Eretz Yisrael. Right? So the commentaries all jump onto this verse. Right? Uh, hello, Moshe Rabbeinu. Are you having? You know, are, are you forgetting something? Uh, why didn't Moshe Rabbeinu go into the land of Israel? We just mentioned at the beginning of the class because of Zikis. Exactly. Right? He struck the he struck the rock. He didn't speak to the rock. So hello, take accountability for yourself, Moshe. Right? What are you blaming the Jews? Yes, the Jewish people did a lot of averos, right? They they did the golden calf and they did the spies and they did others and they complained about the waters and they, they did a lot of things. Right? But hello, it's clear cut in the Torah. Hashem said, because you because the man law is kadash to me when they saw because you didn't sanctify me amongst the Jewish people by talking to rock, but you hit the rock. So you're not gonna go into the land of Israel. So what's Moshe Rabbeinu doing over here blaming the Jewish people? And because of you, because of your words, because of you, because of your words, I can't go into the land of Israel. Because of your words, because of your, it's your fault. So uh, the, there's a few different ways of explaining this, but I want to explain to you with the Archaim HaKados, right? Uh, the famous commentary, the Archaim. Have you guys heard of the Archaim HaKados? Let's just talk about it for a minute. The Archaim. He, uh, he, 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 I think he was from Italy originally, I think so, right? But I don't remember exactly either from Italy or from somewhere in the Middle East, but I think he was from Italy. Um, he came over to Eretz Yisrael, to Jerusalem, uh, sometime in the mid 1800s, right? I don't remember the exact dates, I have to look it up. He came and he became like the rabbi of, 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 of Yushalayim, the small uh, Yushalayim at the time in the 1800s. I mean, he was extremely holy. He was, he was, there's not, a, not so many people that we put the word Kadosh, holy, to their last name. We have Rabbi Kadosh, right, the author of the Mishnah, right? We have the, we have the Archaim Kadosh. We have the Shlach. There's a few people in, 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 throughout the generations where we put the word Kadosh. And he has Archaim Kadosh. Everybody throughout, any, whenever we speak about him, we call him Hakadosh, the Holy One. Right, um, there are stories of him, you know, going up to heaven. Right, there are stories of him communicating with the rabbis in Europe over, you know, through through spirituality, through Kabbalah. Right? He was extremely, extremely, extremely holy. Um, fascinating person. Just the one, one, one story about him um, in the in, in during the when um, uh, when the Jordanians controlled west the west the west. West Bank and the western part of Eretz Yisrael. So they were wanting to make a road. They actually made a road, but they wanted to make a road through Harizasim, right, to make it easy to travel from one village to another village. And the original road, as you could see, sort of the original road was they, so they had to like unearth some farms, some burial sites. The original road that they were doing was gonna have to go over where the Archaim is buried, right? The, the Archaim is buried. And the story is told, and they don't say the story about, about uh, just regular people, right? But this, the story is told that when uh, the tractor, and this didn't happen that long ago, right? When the tractor was going to, you know, the Arabs just took a tractor just to mow over the, 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 the tombstones. When it reached our Chaim's tombstone, it stopped. It died. They got another one, right? And something else broke. The third one, the tractor tripped and fell down the mountain, right? So the Arabs realized, well, also there's spooky people, right? Uh, mm -hmm. they, uh, they're also into these things. So they want, they, it's like, who's buried here? And they, when they heard it was our hand that was buried there, right? They decided they stopped building the road there and they went a few, a little up the mountain and build the road differently. But that's what we're talking about that, you know, this is our Chaim, very, very holy, very, very holy person, right? So the Chaim says something very fascinating. It's a, it's a fascinating, um, answer, and there's a, a, a tremendous lesson to learn from this answer. Rechaim says like this, he says, really, if you stop and think about it, right, the, the, the punishment doesn't fit the crime. Right? The punishment doesn't fit this. So Moshe Rabbeinu did not sanctify the Jews, but he did one mistake. I mean, you know, uh, uh, one, one big mistake he made, right? 
the waters is still a miracle happened because it wasn't the greatest miracle right but it was still wow okay you know you hit the rock and water comes out i mean i don't do that every day right it's still a miracle right so it wasn't we spoke about in the sermon right that shabbos i gave the sermon we spoke about the concept of nuances right for the jewish people it wasn't as big because they already saw that right so we spoke about where the transgression was, what was not considered sanctifying, right? But at the end of the day, right, at the end of the day, the, 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 it's not, you know, for not to be able to go to the land of Israel, right? Something that he wanted, every, everybody wanted to do, that's, that's the punishment. Okay, so punish him a different way. I don't know, punish him up in heaven. You know, there's, there's so many ways that Hashem, you know, could punish him that he can't go into the land of Israel, but that's in most at the beginning of this week's parish, most of was davening, I want to go and I want to go. And I sometimes, no, you can't go in, right? Okay, so change it. Like, so the commentary is asked, like, what's the connection? What's what's the connection? And um, the Rechaim answer is something very powerful. He says, we have to stop for a second, right? And take a step back and look what's going on, right? Imagine Moshe Rabbeinu going to the land of Israel. Moshe Rabbeinu, right? Goes to the land of Israel. If they most Rabbeinu went to the land of Israel, they would have won the war right away. Can okay, we're talking about most Rabbeinu, the, the the most holiest prophet, right, of the Jewish people? They would have gone in. They would have won the war right away. They would have built the Temple Mount. And right? most Rabbeinu would have built the Temple right away. And if most Rabbeinu would have built built the Temple, right, anything that most Rabbeinu did, right, he infused spirituality into it, even to the mundane, he infused spirituality into it. That something that's spiritual cannot be destroyed. Something that is all spiritual cannot be destroyed. If it's not completely spiritual, then it still has room to be destroyed. But it's something that's completely spiritual can be destroyed. That's what they say, you know, about there's great rabbis that they say that when, uh, unfortunately, when they had to unearth the Vilna Gones caver and they had to move him somewhere else, right? Someone by mistake looked, he got punished for it. It was a mistake. They told him not to look, right? But they, he, got, he looked and he said the Vilna Gones body was fully intact 100 years later. Right, a hundred years later, his body was fully intact. Because when something that's fully spiritual, spirituality is not governed by the materialistic world of decay. It's not governed by concept of time, and time is what allows things to fall apart and to and to be destroyed and to and and to decay. So something that's fully spiritual doesn't have that ability. And most Rabbeinu was fully spiritual, and right? most Rabbeinu. That's why it says he had God killed him. Right? How did he die with Nishika with a kiss? Right, kiss of death comes from the Torah, of course. Right, I know it's like a movie, blah blah blah. Right, right, but the kiss of death is comes from the Torah, where Hashem it was a, because he just had to take his in summer because his body was not weak. Right, it says in the end, Lakayin of his eyes didn't even get weak. But was 120 years old, and right? he was full because he was spiritual. So something that is done in, with full spirituality cannot be destroyed. So Hashem was saying like this. Of course, the punishment doesn't reflect the crime. But the Jewish people, right? The Jew, Hashem knew that the Jewish people are not going to be worthy, right? So if Moshe Rabbeinu went in, they built the base of Megdas, right? It can't be destroyed. And if Hashem can't destroy the base of Megdas, right? So then unfortunately, he'll destroy what is able to be destroyed, and that'll be the Jewish people, right? Because we're not all on the level of Moshe Rabbeinu will be destroyed. And that's what it says that when Hashem destroyed the base of Megdas, he destroyed the base of Megdas instead of destroying us. That was the chesed, the kindness that Hashem did. By destroying the base of Migdus, and that's why when we unfortunately we have uh, something going on and it's something physical, a house, a car, or things like this, of course, but a lot of times because Hashem is just ruining that before we get hurt and we have to check into ourselves and we have to reflect. That's for another discussion. And therefore, says the Archaim, says that let's take a little history. And the Jewish people came out of Egypt. They're on a high. They're on a high level, right? We're going to read in a minute. Uh, soon, Moshe Rabbeinu says how the Jewish people heard of God speak on Mount Sinai, right? The first tablets. They heard the words of Hashem. So they reached the level of Adam before the sin. It's called Adam Rishon Chodem Echad. Adam before the sin. They were on a very high spiritual level. But then what happens? Unfortunately, they sin. They do the golden calf. And, and they go down. And that's why the second tablets, there's forgetness and there's, there's oral Torah. And like for another discussion, we can, we don't have a whole class to go on this. Right? And then they do that. So then they do that. And then, then they have an opportunity to, to get, become more spiritual again. Right. And they sin with the, they sin with the, with, with the sin of the spies and they go back down. Right. They go back down again, you know, even though they had another opportunity to, to, to grow, but they didn't. But Hashem wanted Moshe to be able to go into the land of Israel. Hashem wanted the Jewish people to be worthy. 
Therefore, the commentaries ask, why the first time that Hashem told Moshe to hit the rock, and the second time he said to speak the rock? And the Torah says, because you didn't sanctify God, and we said, of course, we spoke about the nuances and this and that, but you didn't sanctify God. Moshe made him sanctify God all the time. Like, so one time he didn't sanctify him the exact same way. To say the commentary, it says, Archaim, it says, Archaim, is because Hashem was giving Moshe the opportunity to, to build the Jewish people back up to the higher spiritual level because they would have made a Kavachomer, they would have said, well, if a rock, right, listens to God by just speaking, how much more we should listen to God when God speaks to us? And it would have made that Kavachomer, they would have made, they would have, they would have said that, and then they would have elevated themselves again to Adam before the Chet, and then Moshe Rabbeinu could have gone into the land of Israel. So really, why couldn't Moshe Rabbeinu go into the land of Israel? Is because the Jewish people sinned, the golden calf, the, the, spin of, the sin of the spies, because the Jewish people were not worthy of Moshe Rabbeinu going into them. When, I, when Hashem told Moshe Rabbeinu this, that he wasn't able to go, it's because, yes, Moshe Rabbeinu, on his level, messed up, right? For us just to clarify it, we have to remember we're talking about Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu messed up right, by not doing not, by not speaking to the rock, instead of hitting the rock, he, 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 the, the punishment wasn't, it was a cause and effect. The punishment, he, what punishment was it that he couldn't go into land Israel because he didn't talk to the rock. Hashem told him, because you didn't sanctify me, now you can't go into the land of Israel because the Jewish people are not holding on the level and you cannot bring them in, right? Because if you bring them in, then everything will be with, done with full spirituality and I won't be able to destroy the temple and then I'll have to destroy the Jewish people. Right, so so that's so. Therefore, most Rabbeinu is reminding them, saying, "No, it's really. Don't forget. No, the, the reason why I can't go into the land of Israel is because because you guys originally sinned, the golden calf, and the and the and the, and the, and the spies, and the other ones. Yes, I have a part to it because I could have brought you up to that level. Uh, but Varchim, because of your words, because of you, right? I wasn't able to go. And what most Rabbeinu is, he wasn't just rubbing it in. Why was he? What was he telling them this? And right? why was he telling them this? And the answer is because Moshe Rabbeinu was telling them this to remind them that we always have to remember two things. Number one, right, that whenever we have an opportunity to grow and to become more spiritual, we have to take that opportunity. We have to find that opportunity, right? Number two, he's reminding the Jewish people, right, that Hashem did not allow Moshe to go into our soul, not as a punishment to them, but it's because he loves them. Because he loves them. And again, if Moshe Rabbeinu would have gone in, Klai Yisrael, the Jewish people, were not holding it on a level of Adam before. They, they were going to do sin again like they did. Right? And then he would not have been able to destroy the Temple Mount. He would not be able to destroy Eretz Yisrael, and, and he would have had to take a wrath out on the Jewish people and not on sticks and stones. Right? And therefore, Moshe Rabbeinu is telling them, we have to, it's all hidden in those words. The Because of you, I couldn't go into the land of Israel, but remember... The reason why I can't go in is because you guys were not holding on that level. But so still, so let us so go in. No, because Hashem loves you and He knows the future. He knows what's going to happen. He doesn't want to have to take the wrath out on you. And He wants to be able to take the wrath out on the sticks and stones, right? And not on you guys. Right? So there's a few, as I said, there's a few lessons to learn from. First and foremost, it's an explanation in the words of the Torah, which is always important. And there's always lessons to be taken. It's explanations of the words of the Torah. And it gives us a more of a uh, wider lens of view of how things are connected from one part of the Torah to another part of the Torah and, and how what well, we see one place, we have to connect it with other parts of the Torah. Right? But the other thing is also, number one, to realize that the more we make something spiritual, right, the more it defies the laws of nature. Right? Because the laws of nature only govern on physical things, not spiritual things. And number two, right, um, number two is remembering that the reason why Moshe couldn't go into land of Israel is because Hashem loves the Jewish people. That's why he did it. Not, not necessarily it was, it was a punishment for Moshe, but it wasn't the punish. It actually was because of love for the Jewish people. Any questions or comments on that? Go ahead. No? Okay, so go ahead. I want to... No, he couldn't go in because well, most because he, the Jewish people were not holding on the level um, for for utopia, 
for, for let's say, for after Mashiach comes, like what we would consider after Mashiach comes. Yeah. If Moshe Rabbeinu would have taken the Jewish people into the land of Israel, then it, w- it should have been sort of like after Mashiach, and, 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 and everything would have been bliss, but the problem is the Jewish people were not holding on that level yet, and they would have sinned again, right? and therefore Hashem would have had to punish them. But he wouldn't be able to take it out on the Beit HaMikdash or on the land of Israel because Moshe Rabbeinu sanctified it on the highest level of sanctification that's possible. And something that is 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 completely is spiritual cannot be destroyed physically. All right? The Romans and the Greeks, and they, they would not have been able to. Exactly. And the Jewish people were not holding on that spiritual level yet. Good. No, but I want to, it's, it's, this is a little more complicated thing. So I, please, if you have one more explanation or question to clarify. Thank you. Okay, good. We're all good. Okay, so let's move on. We have a few more things. Um, okay, so let's move on to verse uh, 41. So verse 41 is a beautiful idea, beautiful. So it says, verse 41 says, Az Yavdil, page 966. So it says, Az Yavdil, Moshe, Shlosha, Arim, Be'evi, Ayardin, the Az, then, right? Moshe went ahead and uh, he settled, right? He, he separated the three cities, the cities of refuge on the side of the Yardin, right? Well, we, the side that they were on, there's actually a picture there on the side, right? Um, the Mizrach Shemes and the, the Mizrach, right? That the Ritzeach, that someone that is kills um, without, with, by mistake, could run to the cities of refuge, right? And I don't want to go into the laws of our Mikla, but just very quickly, right? The laws are like this, someone that kills someone, he runs to the city of refuge, and then the basin will decide if it was on purpose or by mistake. If it was by mistake, right, then he stays in the Aramiklad until uh, the Kohen Gadol passes away. That's the law, right? Until the high priest passes away, he stays in the Aramiklad. If he goes out of the Aramiklad, right, the, any family, immediate family member has the right to avenge the blood, right? And he has, it's called Dhamma of Arosho. His blood is on his own head, right? If he goes out of the Aramiklad, Right, because any family member has the right to avenge, even though it's a mistake, but their family member has the right to avenge, avenge that person's that immediate family member. So that's the laws of the Ari Mikla. Right? So that's a great question. The Talmud speaks about this. Right? So the Talmud says that uh, the, f- the family should go with them. It depends on how easy it is to uproot this and that. Actually says that if a, uh, if, let's say, uh, someone that has uh, students, his students should go with him to learn to continue learning with him. And so the Talmud goes into details about this. It's a great question. <coughs> Excuse me. But great question. The Talmud speaks about that, um, you know, what happens if he dies there? Should he be buried there? Should he be taken back to it? You know, that's uh, that, that's a great question. All right, then. Right. Yeah. She right. She, right. She she was the first. Uh, she was the first. She 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 was the original care shop Arab Shabbos care package. Right. Uh, she was a, the the mother of the Kohen Gadol. And so so the commentaries want to know. And Ramosha Feinstein. I mean, others talk about this, but uh, I've seen this many times. Ramosha Feinstein, of uh, blessed memory. And uh, they want to know what was Moshe Rabbeinu doing. It says, "Us." And then Moshe Rabbeinu went and he and he he set up the three cities, right? Aver Yarden. But the Talmud tells us that the three cities, Aver Yarden, did not uh, become a city of refuge until the cities in the land of Israel were set up first. Right? The cities in the land of Israel first had to be set up, and once they became sort of sanctified as a city of refuge, then the cities. And the Ever Yardin were, were all of a sudden coletas. They got sort of a uh, spiritual force field around them. Right? They, that's where they got, and they, they could protect. So, so the comment says, so what was Moshe Rabbeinu 
go so busy and the Torah tells us, oh, it's, you must have went and he separated and he designated these cities. They weren't active yet. What was he doing? Like he had, had nothing better else to do with the last days of his life. Right? He was, it was fruitless. He, they, he wasn't doing anything. He was just saying, okay, this is going to be the city of refuge. This is gonna be, but they weren't going to be active until until they go into the land of Israel, which is not enough for another few years. And until after they win the war, another seven years. Right? So it's going to be a few more years until the cities were going to be uh, activated. Right? So what was, what was the Torah making such a big deal about Moshe Rabbeinu going and doing this? Right? And why did Moshe Rabbeinu go and do this? And Moshe Rabbeinu finds he says something very powerful and something that we we all have to live by. Says Ramos of Feinstein that Moshe Rabbeinu had such a love for mitzvahs. He had such a love of trying to connect with Hashem that even though he knew that the, these cities are not going to be activated until the other cities in the land of Israel are activated, but he wanted to have some connection to the mitzvah. He wanted to have whatever ability of a connection that he had to mitzvah. So he went and he said, okay, these are going to be the cities of city refuge. I know they're not going to be activated until another seven years from now. I know it's going to take time, but at least I'm going to have a hand in this mitzvah. At least I'm going to be part of this mitzvah to, 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 in, in, a certain, in a certain sense. Right? And, and says Ramos of Feinstein that that was who Moshe Rabbeinu was. And that's something that we have to learn from. If we have an opportunity to be part of a mitzvah, right? especially if we can actually do the mitzvah, I don't know if we could be part of him, so even though we, you know, we 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 not may be able to do the whole thing, or it's not going to, you know, whatever the little bit that we do. But if we can be part of a mitzvah, whatever that may be, right? We make phone calls to ensure that we have a minion, right? We make sure that we we, we give our, we have schools that are functioning in our set. We make sure that we the, the 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 poor have food, and we make sure that people are taken care of. And whatever mitzvah we have the opportunity to, right? We buy a siddur, even though we might not be able to pray with it right away. At least we buy it. We have it on our shelf, right? We we want to be part of a mitzvah. We have a a chuka. We have a yearning. As we start in the beginning, at the Vekas, we want to be connected, we want to be glued to Hashem, right? To any opportunity to even be a little bit connected, right? Moshe Rabbeinu took advantage of it. Right? And that's, that's, that's something that's extremely powerful to learn from Moshe Rabbeinu. Even Moshe Rabbeinu was holding on such a high spiritual level, right? Even, this, even something that wasn't really even a full mitzvah yet. But uh, I have an opportunity to be part of this a little bit. I want to be part of it. Right, uh, and that's something that we could all learn from. That's true, but they weren't going to be activated until, bless you, they weren't going to be activated until the Jewish people went into the land of Israel, right, and, and they conquered the land, and they set up the ones in the land of Israel, right? So that's the question. So why would... Right, it's still... It's still, the women are still in state, but still the city to be activated as a spiritual force field, to be activated as considered a Aramikla, the city of refuge, right? It didn't have the status of a city of refuge. Even though most Rabbinians said these are going to be the cities, it still didn't have that status until they set up the ones in the land of Israel. But that's the idea. We're saying that even though they weren't going to have the status, but at least most Rabbinians are trying to have some kind of connection with it. And that's what the Torah is making the deal. Oh, so then most Rabbeinu went to, to, Torah makes a big deal. Even this, where it wasn't a full mitzvah, he, at least he's being part of something, right? Connected to the mitzvah a little bit. He had that yearning. He tried to be part of that. Right. The Torah goes ahead and tells us that he was part of it. And that's the lesson. Right. Exactly. The lesson to people that any opportunity that you have to try to be part of a mitzvah, right? We have to try to take that on to try to be part of that mitzvah. Okay, we'll uh, we'll end with one more uh, one more thing, and that's what I told you in the beginning. Uh, if you go to chapter four five, sorry. So just uh, very quickly, we're not going to go through this, um, but the, the next part of the Torah goes through the Ten Commandments. Where we read the Ten Commandments again in this week's Torah portion, all right? Um, and of course, there's tons to speak about the Ten Commandments. Uh, we'll have Mirza Shemparis Yisro to speak about it, all right? Um, more at length. Uh, but uh, we're not going to go. We're not going to go through the Ten Commandments now. I'll just say one quick thing because um, if it, it's one interesting thing, there's a lot of interesting things. Right? But if you go to uh, verse uh, page 970, verse 17, uh, the word lo sirtzach, right? You should not kill, right? So if you look at the Hebrew spelling, right, it has the tzadi. The letter tzadi has a pasach, has a straight line. Underneath it, right? Again, back to vowels. We spoke about vowels the other day, right? Um, 
but yeah, actually yesterday we spoke about vowels, right? Um, but if you go to Parsis Yistro, right, when it speaks about the Ten Commandments, right, on page and verse um, page four ten. I say lo sach. So over here it also has it with a pasach, but the commentaries tell us the way we read it in the Chumash, the way it has it, and that's why it's not. Uh, to, we have to look at the way we read it, right? The Chumashim that have it the way we read it, right? Over here in 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 by us, right? The way we read it is we read it lo sach with a kamat. Right, even though it's not spelled that way in the Torah, right? Um, I, I apologize for making you go back and forth, but the way it's the way it's writ, read is lower search sach with a kamat, with uh, with a line and a and a line going down. And um, I, I heard from my father many times. He said it over from I forgot who he said it over from. And he says why in one place does it say with a pasach one way it's read again kriya the way it's read is with a kamat. Um, is because it's referring to another kind of killing. It's referring to um, educators, people that have the ability to educate. Right? Sometimes you could kill by opening up your mouth. So we've all had those kind of teachers. Right? Uh, you know, uh, teachers that open up the mouth, they don't know how to teach so well, or they open up the mouth and they ridicule or they put down people, or, so, or not necessarily just teachers, but you could kill someone by opening up your mouth. Right? But you could also kill someone by closing your mouth. Right, someone that does have the ability to teach, someone that does have the, the, the that that influence, someone that is part of a community and and says, no, I'm just going to keep I'm going to keep quiet. But they have that influence and they have what to say and they have the right thing to say. And if they say something, right, that one or few times that they say something will can make a big impact the direction of the synagogue, can make a big impact direction of the family, can make a big impact on the direction of 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 a, of a school or whatever it is. Right. So if you close your mouth, you could also be killing people. All right, uh, so it says, says it's it. My father was saying this. He says this. He gives a course to educators. So he's giving. He said you have to know what kind of person you are and when to say something, when not to say something. This also applies to all of us in our daily lives. All right. Uh, sometimes we think, no, nah, I'm just going to be quiet. I'm not the person to say something. No, you are the person to say something. All right. Or you know, I I I, I don't want to get involved. Or if you know someone that could help out someone and you just no, nah, nah, I don't want to. You could be killing, not necessarily killing, but you could be hurting someone or institution or something by not saying something, or vice versa. Sometimes when you open up your mouth, you could also be hurting someone. That is more common than not. Right? We hurt people by what we say or how we say it or, um, or, or, or when we're not supposed to be speaking. Um, so that's another form of ritzicha, another form of killing. This one thing on the Saras of Dibbas, we're not, as I said, hopefully in Parsis Yisro, uh, the class will still be going, and we will uh, talk more about the Ten Commandments then. Um, so I just want to end off with, as I mentioned, we're going to speak about Shema Yisrael. So on page 972 on the bottom, uh, chapter 6, verse uh, 4, is one of the most, probably the most famous verse uh, in, in all of Jewish history, and probably as unaffiliated someone is, most probably knows this verse, right? Unfortunately, there are people that are unaffiliated that don't, are such a, uh, so unaffiliated that don't even know this verse, but almost almost everybody knows, anybody that's affiliated a little bit knows this verse, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. Listen, O Israel, and Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Yigad, Hashem Echad is one God. And then it goes into the into the Vahafta, right? The 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 Vahafta Eishamatecha, right? And it continues with some of the more of the Shema, right? Um, and then it continues some other things, and we're not going to talk about that uh, this year. But I want to talk about the Shema for a second, right? So we spoke about what Shema represents. I want to talk about the rest of the Shema. Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Achad. Hashem our God. Hashem is one. Right. What are these two names of Hashem? What, is, what does it mean? What are we trying to invoke? What are we trying to connect to when we say the Shema? We say it, but, but we have to have a little more meaning about what we're saying when we're saying it. What are we actually saying? 
So my Rosh Hashiva, blessed memory, he actually are the one that married me and my wife, Rav Chaim Epstein. I used to always say in his talks, always he always stuck it in somehow, right? That that there's Hashem when when and it's brought down in many places, right? But always associated with hearing my Rosh Hashiva speak, standing on his stender, and he said. So sort of is in, in my mind, and he's speaking, right? But um, but Hashem, when it says the word Hashem, Hashem refers to when God manifests Himself in a merciful way. That's what Hashem means. Elokeinu, our King, right? Our King represents when God manifests Himself as, in a judgment way, right? That's what it means, right? So Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem, when He manifests Himself in a merciful way. Right? Thank God things are going well. Things are good. Right? Elokeinu, when God manifests himself to us in a judgment way, unfortunately things are rough. We don't have to, you know, uh, in our own lives, in Jewry, right? Un unfortunately things are rough. Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. Still one God. Right? There's no division of power. Right? There's no, uh, you know, good God, bad God. There's no devil. Right? There's no, no concept of a devil. And right? yes, we have a Sahar, but Yitzhak Sahar is an angel of Hashem, and he wants us to overcome him. The angel wants us to win. And his job is to try to trick us, but there's no concept of a devil. Right? There's no concept of that. Right? Hashem Elokim is this one God, and what kind of God is it? Even when it's manifest to us as Elokim as judgment. Hashem Echad. It's not a little Kim Echad. Hashem Echad. It's one God. He's merciful. Right? He loves us. He wants to take care of us. Right? Hashem Echad is only one God. And it's the God of, of, of love. A God of Ava that cares about us. Even when he manifests himself as a Lokim, as judgment, we have to remember that it's hard for us. We have to remember that still Hashem that loves us. And this is, I believe, and people have brought this down, right? is why this verse is what has been on the lips of Jewish people throughout history, the most difficult times in our lives, right? During pogroms, during inquisitions, right? During the Holocaust, September, October 11th, whatever it is, it's on the lips, right? Because we are reminding ourselves that even when our lives, Rabbi Kiva, when his body was being raked, right? By the Romans, right? It's one of the kinos that we read on Tisha B'Av. I know Rabbi Nimtsumsky spoke about it in the morning. Right? One of the kind of it speaks about how Rabbi Kiva's body was being raped. It says, Yatsin is Shabbat his soul left with the ver with the ending of the verse Echad one. He said, Shema Yisrael Shem Shem Echad. And throughout history, Jewish people have put their lives on the line with Shema Yisrael because we were reminding ourselves that at the most at the most at the, at the most difficult times in our lives when Hashem is manifesting himself in, in, in the most apparent way as judgment. We are reminding ourselves that we want to ensure that our neshama, right? If God forbid, if it's on the line or it's in a difficult time or we're sick or whatever it is, Hashem Echad, it's one God, but it's a merciful God. And that's something that we have to always remind ourselves. And that's what the verse is saying. And this is the, this is the, the most precious verse, right, that the Jewish people have to remind ourselves in good times and unfortunately in bad times that Hashem Echad is one God, but it's a merciful God. And uh, Hashem, may we see the mercy of Hashem speedily in our days. Uh, maybe we zocha that, um, as we say on Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah, uh, that Hashem should get up from the kise of din, God should get up from the cheer of judgment and uh, go on to the cheer of mercy, right? And, 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 and continue to... Uh, Deal with us and judge us, and, and, and with mercy, we are unworthy. Right? But we are continuously asking Hashem, and may we see all the captives come home quickly, and all our soldiers come home safe, and the people in Israel should be safe, and people in America, and, and we should all have health, and we should all have you know prosperity, and, and we should all be able to uh, cling to Hashem, right, uh, and, and to be devoted to Hashem in 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 good times. And, and continue to clo get closer to Tasha. Thank, thank you all for joining us. A wonderful trip. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. We're going to be going to.